You are listening to the Make Change Happen podcast from IIED, the International Institute for Environment and Development. Sustainable Development Goal 14, Life Below Water, seeks to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas and marine resources. To meet the 10 targets of the goal and ensure the many benefits from oceans, seas and coasts are available to everyone in an inclusive blue economy, action is needed both in the policy arena and in fishing practice. What is the economic value of marine and coastal ecosystems and small-scale fisheries? How can incentives be employed for sustainable fisheries management? How can we ensure future high seas governance regimes or treaties are equitable and benefit all? To answer these and other questions, in this podcast, our Director of Communications, Liz Carlisle, talks with two expert colleagues who are leading IID's research in this area. Hi, and welcome to IID's new podcast, Make Change Happen. I'm your host today, I'm Liz Carlisle. I'm Director of Communications at IIED, and I'm going to guide us through a conversation with two of my colleagues. I've got on my left, Essam Yassin Mohammed. He's head of the Inclusive Blue Economy team here, and a fisheries economist. Can I call you that, Essam? Yes, absolutely fine. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And formerly, you were head of the Fisheries Promotion Unit for the Ministry of Fisheries in Eritrea. On my right here is Laura Kelly. Uh, You are head of our Sustainable Markets Research Group. And formerly, I think you were with Department for International Development as head of business engagement and the business hub. Have I got that right? Yeah, that's right, Liz. Great to to be here and uh, part of this conversation. I'm very much looking forward to it. Good. I think we've got a few little issues here we can tease out. Sam, what got you into kind of fisheries? I know it's been one of your particular passions. Um, so it goes back uh, to when I was in Eritrea a very long time ago. Um, I had this slightly unhealthy obsession with one particular fish <laughs> called orange face butterfly fish. They're extremely beautiful creatures. They're ornamental fish in the Red Sea. And essentially, I spent an awful lot of time, maybe hundreds, if not thousands of hours, snorkeling and diving to understand their behavior, that when they breed and how they mate and all that. And that's what got me into fisheries in the, pers- in the first place. I decided to train as an economist and then end up being this very funny hybrid of a marine biologist and an economist. Well, I'm glad you're here with us, and we'll, we're going to benefit yeah. from that funny hybrid. Sure. Laura, what about you? I suppose the fish in your sea are kind of businesses, supply chains, all sorts of different characters. What, what's the interest for you around fisheries? Well, I think, um, as Sam explained from his own personal history, oceans and fish mean a lot to people, and Putting people at the centre of development is really important for success and for sustainability. And I actually think, you know, the approach that we take here at IID is really about trying to get people at the centre of things. So we've got lots of fish and they're important, but the people are really important too. And I think that leads us very, very nicely to what we're talking about today. Mm-hmm. And so perhaps perhaps you can kind of kick us off. Perhaps you, Sam. Mm-hmm. Um uh, I know this is a conversation, but I think give, giving our listeners a bit of context would yeah. really help. So what do we actually mean by an inclusive blue economy? So I would say uh, it is a, it's a, it's an ocean-based economy that tries or aims to balance um, uh, economic gains, of course, and uh, cultural and environmental uh, gain. So how do you strike a balance between all the three? But at the same time, when we do so, making sure that you know, the people who depend on these resources for their livelihood are not left behind. I think that's really key. In business, they often talk about the triple bottom line, something that's important for people and for the environment and for business. Mm-hmm. And I've been really struck talking to you about some of your work working with small-scale fishers. I mean, it's amazing that there are, you know, most of the fish in the world are actually caught by small and medium enterprises. Those are, you know, mm-hmm. like, you know mom and pop businesses. They're not the big uh, international, transnational companies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that, that, that that's really important to remember 
in, in this debate that actually when we talk about business, we're not just talking about big trawler ships. We're talking about small, often fisherwomen. Um, it was great. I uh, went to the um, Blue Economy Conference in Nairobi uh, back in October last year. And it was great to meet some of the fisherwomen there, um, women from the Tanzanian Fish Workers Association. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, great stories to tell about how they're mm-hmm. mobilising and bringing mm-hmm. their issues into mm-hmm. into these sort of real, uh, really important debates mm-hmm. about development. Absolutely. And I know, Assam, you've been to Bangladesh many times, I think, with the Hilsa fisheries community. Mm-hmm. You must have... Give us an example of maybe a fisherman or a fisherwoman that you've met and has really struck a chord with you. I can give you an example in Bangladesh, since you mentioned Bangladesh Liz, uh, where we went with this very well-developed research proposal to uh, work with fishers and and with the government to find a way how to maximise the benefits that these small-scale fishers receive. And as I will share my story, my project plan with the fisher man at that time, and he completely dismissed our hypothesis and research questions, etc. The greatest um, lesson from that was to be able to listen to those individuals and see them as a source of inspiration and knowledge and information, and factor that in our research approach. So these are the people experiencing that catch every day. It's ups and downs, Absolutely. when it's working, when it's not, Absolutely. when they can make enough money, when they can't, Absolutely. and so on. Absolutely, indeed. Yeah. And if I were to pick up on what Laura just said about the significance of uh, small-scale fisheries, as we call them, uh, essentially small-scale fisheries, of course, what it means is that people who've got small capacity boats, maybe some, some of them have very small powered engines, some of them they are, don't have any engine, etc., and globally speaking, they contribute up to more than 50% of the seafood supply globally. And guess what? They employ more than 95% of the global fisheries as well. So we're talking about a large economy labelled as a small scale. But the other thing is, those 95% don't get 95% of the benefits of, the, of global fish stocks. They also only go out, what, a couple of miles from the, the coastline. What about the big oceans? Because that's where a lot of those fish come from. They go to spawn. Uh, we really need to think about the ocean in its entirety, even though we're focusing on small-scale fishers. So the best way to put it into perspective is, um, so when you look at the planet, of course, you know, about 70-75%, I believe, is covered by water, significant portion of it being uh, the ocean. And in terms of how we manage it, 50% of that planet's surface area, at the, this point in time, as we speak, we don't have any legal instrument of any sort to govern 50% of the planet. So this means that whoever's got the best resources and who can ever can go out and do what they want with the ocean for their own interests that's, can do that. That's exactly, that's exactly what's happening as we speak now. So whoever has got the financial and technical means to go out there and exploit the, uh, the ocean resources is, uh, is able to do so. But Essam, there's the, a, a, a new international negotiation that's sort of uh, just you know, been going on for about a year or so that's actually trying to redress that imbalance. And it, it, it's a negotiation between national governments. Um, what, what's your sort of perspective on that as a way to try to regulate a bit or to, under, to, to uh, better distribute the benefits mm-hmm. from the, that deep sea? So if you're a coastal state... Or nation, you can claim up to 200 nautical miles, up to 200 miles from your coastal line as your national sovereignty. Anything beyond that doesn't belong to anyone. That's what I was referring to as the, uh, what's commonly called as the international waters or the high seas. Now, the positive side of the story is member states of the United Nations now have agreed to come together to negotiate and strike a deal in developing a legal instrument to govern this portion of the high seas and to exactly redress that point that you mentioned about Liz earlier, which is now 
anyone who's got the financial and technical means can go and exploit it. But now we're saying, no, this one, this almost half or 50% of the planet belongs to everyone. What we, in legal terms, we call the a common heritage of mankind. This belongs to me, you, our children, grandchildren, and the future generation as well. So therefore, how do we make sure there is a fair and just and sustainable way of managing this resource and whatever benefits extracted from that part of the world is shared fairly and equitably. These are the areas beyond national jurisdiction. That's correct. That this new process run by UNCLOS is looking at. UNCLOS, Liz, what's that? That's the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, I hope. Well done, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just getting my head around some of these terms. and it, It's a very technical area. Um, there's another agreement around um, biodiversity. There's just been this report showing that um, you know, we are losing um, biodiversity at an alarming rate, millions of species, some we don't even know yet. Uh, but they seem to focus quite a lot on land. Um, I imagine there's also a... Um, uh, a water-based uh, marine aspect to that in terms of biodiversity loss. There's an intergovernmental body that was set up that has uh, thousands of experts in it. And this together. is IPBES, is That's it? Correct. This is the Intergovernmental IP. Science Policy Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Exactly. In short, IPBS or IPBES, as people call it. So these experts came together just to assess uh, the magnitude of the threat that the planet is facing, or biodiversity, or nature is facing. And what's very striking in relation to the conversation that we're having today is they identify overfishing as one of the major threats to marine biodiversity. Now, let's link that up to the, what we've just been discussing about these high seas negotiations. Within the high seas negotiations, there is no mandate or scope to discuss um, fishing in the high seas because that's better dealt, according to some, in the UN Fish Stocks Agreement or regional bodies. But what we're saying is we cannot talk about biodiversity in the high seas without tackling this biggest threat that marine biodiversity is facing, which is fishing. But exactly, there's a huge threat because uh, a lot of that large-scale fishing is heavily subsidised. There are you know, a number of large-scale fishing fleets from Europe, uh, from other parts of the world. Um, and it's really difficult to address that issue of subsidies. I think the negotiations have been going on in the World Trade Organisation now for about five years. Uh, I think there's an opportunity potentially at the end of this year. Um, the governments have committed to reach an agreement on reducing subsidies. But I think we also have to remember that sometimes some kind of financial support to the small-scale fishers is, is really important because if you want to protect fish stocks and you have a closed season or a marine protected area, if you're a small-scale fisherman who relies on that resource, You've got no other source of livelihood. So, SM, mm -hmm. the team, and you, you've been doing some work looking at how to actually use subsidies, and we do call it subsidies, in a way to support uh, better uh, fish stock conservation. If a fishing fleet was to go hundreds of miles from the coast and do fishing there and come back, that would be economically not feasible. The only way it can be economically feasible is when governments provide an offload of subsidy to reduce the cost. It could be the fuel subsidy, for instance. Don't worry about the cost of fuel. We'll give you this much money to um, subsidise that. And that's what's enhancing the capacity of these fleets to go out there and hoover the sea, essentially. So what we're calling for is we need to bring an end to that. And hopefully, governments have agreed to hopefully strike a deal to eliminate quote-unquote harmful subsidies. We must make it clear at IIED we're not necessarily against subsidies. We're against harmful subsidies. What we say is there needs to be a transition from bad to good. One may ask, what's a good subsidy? And that goes back to exactly the point that 
Laura was mentioning about, for instance, you impose a no-take season in Mauritania or Bangladesh or elsewhere. How do you expect them to survive throughout that closed season? That's when you bring in subsidy, provide them subsidy to survive during the closed season, and allow the fish stock to recover for the fish to breed, produce more fish, and then that would sustain the sector and the economy. So. Yes, again, I can't emphasise more, but I think we need to work with governments to support them and to put pressure on them to strike a balance by the end of the year to eliminate harmful subsidy. And this is a target within the Sustainable Development Goals that need to be met by 2020, a few months down the line. That one's 2020, but the goals overall are 2030. So we've got, you know, we've got another 12 years, but those are 17 goals, and goal 14 is on life below water. So it's a really important part of the uh, sustainable development goals. Um, but there are other things that obviously um, marine life can contribute to biodiversity, as, as we've already talked about, but also tourism. Um, Small-scale fishers are obviously one part of the coastal um, economy, but tourism, we've got many beautiful parts of the ocean, the reefs, and they're all under threat as well from overuse. So finding sustainable ways to use the oceans as a whole, I think, is really important. I've been quite interested uh, recently looking at things like marine protected areas for tourism, but um, many developing country governments just don't have the resources to set those reserves up and then to actually uh, pay for their upkeep or to pay for them actually being properly monitored. Um, so we, we've done some uh, work looking at the role of private finance to support that. There's a really growing movement now uh, of impact investors, people who want to see really positive social and environmental outcomes for their investments, and they're prepared to sort of accept a slightly lower rate of return. Um, but they're the kind of people who you could attract to invest into a coastal reserve off of uh, Mozambique or around Labu in, in Kenya or in places in the Caribbean. Um, but it's really important to have a really good system by which you can demonstrate to those investors that there's really been uh, the impact that they've hoped to invest in uh, and sometimes local communities can be part of uh, that kind of monitoring uh, but again the SDGs can provide a framework it's yeah a, a lot of targets within uh, goal 14 but that is a way at least that everybody is judged by the same uh, principles in terms of reducing fishing or concerning the, the environment so that's an area where I think the private sector again can can play a role um, we've talked a lot about small scale fishers um, and we were talking also about the the, the deep seas I mean to, to what extent SM do you think things like deep sea mining are really going to take off if there was any positive development in the way we govern the ocean and the marine environment is the setting up marine protected areas. A number of experts and others who work in this space would agree with me in saying that that's the only aspect that we are on track in achieving. Of course, there's a, a debate about quality versus quantity, as um, Laura was mentioning earlier, of course, when you talk about the effectiveness and the way they're implemented, the way they're financed, etc. We can raise so many questions, but at least if we were to look at the, num the surface area that's being put aside as marine reserve, there's a very encouraging um, development. Now, the second question is with respect to um, uh, the, high s the deep sea mining is a very interesting um, development as well. When the law of the sea was codified in 1982, it became an international treaty in 1982, we didn't really anticipate as much prospect for uh, deep sea mining, but suddenly technology allowed us to do more of that, hence why people are taking it very seriously. Therefore, that's where now the International Seabed Authority and other partners are working together to, to, to strike a fine balance between, yes, allowing human prosperity from an economic point of view, but also making sure that activity doesn't harm uh, or that doesn't pose a threat to marine life. So as a, as a layperson, this sounds overwhelmingly complex. 
Right. We've got the bad things that are going on, the kind of the dumping. You know, we, we all know about the plastics that's been raised and people are very much behind that. We've got overfishing. We've got big vested interests. Uh, we've got small scale fishers trying to make a livelihood. I think you said earlier, you know, 50 percent of this resource belongs of our world is oceans yeah. Um, yeah. and that is something that we need to get better at governing understanding and sharing as a kind of common heritage of man exactly. e- equal benefits so this sounds a little bit like a free-for-all uh, to me it sounds sort of complex and disorganized and i'm assuming that this process around the a b and j the areas beyond national jurisdiction is a way that we're trying to get that organized so why is this an issue now? Why is it important now? You know, and I think also between us, you know, does everyone agree it's important now? I think uh, to come back to the lovely David Attenborough and the Blue Planet and now his series on Netflix, um, you know, my, my daughters have just been blown away by watching that. I mean, the, the technology enables the most incredible photographs to be taken, but just to see the scale of these um, shoals of fish and to see uh, the dolphins uh, in the oceans, it brings it home to people in a way that I think um, it, it's a sort of, it's a really timely moment to act. It's almost like the sort of the, the tipping point that mo- more people are concerned uh, about this. Um, so it is taking advantage of that um, public interest and pushing governments across the world to seize the uh, opportunity of the ABNJ negotiations. Uh, but I think business is also realising that a more sustainable use of uh, high seas resources uh, is in their interests as well. Businesses uh, employ people, even the large scale businesses, and Many of them have committed to the SDGs. There are many SDG frameworks. Um, But as I think I said earlier, a key thing is how do we demonstrate, or how do they demonstrate, and how do we hold them to account for delivering on these things? So, Esam, we haven't mentioned um, BBNJ, which is biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. So that's clearly important, and from an IAD perspective, important to people. So can you tell us a bit about indeed, that? Indeed, indeed, yes. So uh, BBNJ, we, we referred to it earlier as um, the high seas. There was sort of the common but wrong perception about the high seas that is too remote to matter. Mm-hmm. Coastal communities, they don't go beyond uh, 3 to 6 or 12 miles. Um, so why are we bothered for something that's 200 plus miles away from the coast? And um, this is exactly what we did very recently in IID in partnership with the National Geography Centre, is we try to look at that the fact that you know the high seas and coastal waters are highly interconnected systems. And the best way to explain this is using rubber ducks. That famous story about, you know, the so container, precisely, that was abundant in 1992 with thousands um, of uh, rubber ducks. And that's what changed our perception when these rubber ducks were being found in a number of other thousands or hundreds of miles away from where they were dumped. And this is due to the highly interconnected system of uh, the ocean. So what we've done is we tried to look at uh, the reliance of coastal uh, developing countries, particularly the poorest of the poor of the countries, how those coastal communities or their coastal ecosystems or waters uh, were interconnected with areas that were hundreds of thousands of miles away. And therefore, that sort of information becomes very important for two th- reasons. One is to, to um, emphasise that the health of the high seas is extremely important for the livelihoods of coastal communities, particularly in those poorer countries. And the second reason being the, the governance um, measures that we take for the protection of the high seas need to take into account how they may benefit these coastal communities. I loved your rubber duck story, Essam. I mean, yeah. it's like, is that the origins of the plastic pollution problem we have now? <laughs> All of those rubber ducks. 28,000, Laura. 28,000. Interestingly, people refer to them as friendly rubber ducks. 
because there is a friendly big, floaties huge, or something. Yeah, yeah, friendly floaties, right? Exactly. It's because there's a huge following globally, sort of you know, people are very <laughs> enthusiastic about you know taking pictures. We have identified a found one and they post them in this website, and it's it's it's, it's almost like the what's it called the Pokemon Go game <laughs> yes. of, of that sort. Well, I think that's brought us to a very nice place because all of this was looking a little bit high level. <laughs> but I think uh, we, we're sort of drawing to a close now. But um, So I'd like to ask, how can we get this down to, you know, what can the person in the street do? Um, is it any good, for example, buying fish with a sustainable sticker? What's the message here for those of us who are not deep in the process? I guess I think the, the public awareness uh, through this excellent documentary such as uh, that of uh, David Attenborough, for instance, uh, that raises the awareness of the public, sort of, you know, making sure that whatever is on their table is sustainably sourced. Sustainably in a sense that ecologically sustainable, but also making sure that no one was harmed uh, when that fish was caught. You know, this industry has got an awful lot of story about, you know, modern day slavery, etc. Et that we need to be aware of. Of course, we can discuss that, but I think people making conscious decision in terms of uh, demanding a sustainable uh, 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 seafood, for instance, and and obviously uh, the business will be able to react or to respond to that demand. And presumably, uh, with the growing interest that you know we've got a climate crisis or a climate emergency rather than just a climate change, this must have a relationship. This must be something that people can be interested in and understand. The oceans are a huge carbon sink. So if we start overfishing, we start destroying natural habitats, CO2, more CO2 is going to be released into the atmosphere and that's going to make climate change even worse, sea level rise. And of course, it's going to be those poor coastal communities that are going to be hurt. But those of us who live quite near the Thames in London, we might think it's quite nice now, but when we're six feet underwater, we're not going to think it's so good. So it really is about changing our behaviours more broadly, um, you know, uh, turning off our lights, not driving so much, all of these things are really interconnected um, and the public interest in things like plastics and the oceans um, and the sort of cl- the response to, as you say, the climate crisis, feels like now's a really good point to be acting and to be talking about how important these things are and what it is, as you say, Liz, the ordinary person in the street can do. So to finish then, Sam, I'm going to ask you, what change do you think can happen quite soon in the work you're doing that would make a difference? I guess um, the most important thing that needs to happen or that can happen is that uh, as we started off this conversation is bringing people at the heart, at the core of this blue economy discourse. So for me, it's about making sure the, the, the integrity of our blue economy or our ocean and marine resources is not compromised and we're not compromising the livelihoods of those people who rely on this resource to survive. And that can be done, I'm 100% sure, so long as there's a political will to end harmful subsidies and, and making sure that uh, those um, systemic constraints that stop people f- from maximising their benefit from the ocean in a sustainable way are eliminated. So this is possible? I generally believe so. Good. Laura, what about a change that should happen, but you're perhaps less convinced that we can do it quick enough? Well, I think we should be able to reach an agreement in these um, ABNJ negotiations. But as we've seen in other international negotiations, like the World Trade Organization or on climate, it takes a long time. And there are lots of competing interests around the table. But at IID, we are working with the poorest countries in those negotiations to ensure that um, their concerns are held, uh, are, are taken forward. So uh, I think their concerns should be part of the negotiation, and we're working to try to support that. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I hope it's okay to give um, a little plug before I say thank you. We've got three animations that I think your team was responsible for, Sam. One is called No Hidden Catch. The other is about fiscal policy tools, going back to your point about, I think, not having subsidies that support bad practice, but thinking of them incentives to support good practice. 
And then we have something that explains governing the high seas. Short animations to be found on www.iied.org if you'd like to know more. But can I finish by thanking Laura Kelly uh, and Essam Yassin Mohammed for a very interesting conversation. And for more about Laura and Essam's work and the issues discussed today, visit the Fisheries and Sustainable Markets sections of our website. You'll find them under the Our Work menu on the homepage. You'll discover related projects, articles, news and multimedia, along with many freely downloadable research publications. You have been listening to the Make Change Happen podcast from IIED, the International Institute for Environment and Development. The podcast has been produced by our in-house communications team. For more information about IIED and our work, please visit our website at www.iied.org.